of doing it. So first of all, I would like to uh, thank Professor Long for, for giving us this lecture. Uh, he's Professor of History at Eastern Michigan University and has been there since 1987. And tonight he's going to talk to us uh, about the life of Liaquat Ali Khan, the first Prime Minister of Pakistan, and of course a pivotal figure in, in the creation of Pakistan. So I think we have a, a very interesting um, time ahead of us. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Professor Long now. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Alison. Uh, thank you for everyone for uh, being here and for allowing me to uh, give this uh, talk today. And I certainly look forward to your comments at the end of my talk. Liaquat Ali Khan had a full and interesting life, a life which is not yet fully documented, I think, in the history of Pakistan uh, or in the uh, independence movement, in the Pakistan movement. And I hope that I can uh, contribute to uh, filling out the story, the remarkable story of the life of the Ali Khan. There were three main stages of his life. The first was up until 1941, really, when he was a regional politician associated with the United Provinces. The second stage of his life, and is very distinct, was uh, as a national figure in India. Uh, from 1941 up until 1947. That was the second stage of his life. The final stage of his life, of course, is well known to Pakistanis, although not as well known, I believe, as it should be. Uh, and that was from 47 until October 16th of 1951. Although, of course, his uh, objectives resolution 1949 uh, continues to resonate uh, in Pakistan as the basis of the uh, Pakistan constitution uh, today. The Akhat was a Punjabi, according to uh, some people, very much a Punjabi. And he was born in 1895 in Karnal. His father was the Nawab of Karnal. The family had lived in the Punjab, moving from the United Provinces, the area around New Delhi, around about 1805. And uh, they had had lands in both Karnal, Karnal district, and across the Jumna in Muzaffanaga. And it is said in India, even today, four families owned Muzaffanaga district. Liaquat's family was one of those four families. So they had lands on both sides. They had property on both sides uh, and uh, houses on both sides. But he grew up in Karnal. His mother was supposed to be an imposing lady, a very imposing lady who made sure that he grew up in the traditions of Islam, uh, knowing the Hadith uh, and uh, other um, uh, religious uh, teachings. Uh, and he grew up uh, privilege in the uh, Nawab Koti in the downtown uh, Kanal, a land of privilege in an extended family with his uh, father, with his uncle, uh, and with his cousins, uh, his first cousin, J uh, Jahangira, uh, who would become his first wife. Uh, and uh, uh, he grew up in this uh, tradition of service to the community. Uh, it was his family that gave a lot of land away to build the hospital in Karnal, which still exists, of course, uh, even uh, today. So he grew up in uh, Karnal, a determined young boy um, who was educated in the school that was run by Sabir Khan, who was a graduate of Aligarh Muslim uh, University. Liaquat was considered to be the smartest of the family, smarter than his younger, uh, his older brother, Sajad, uh, with whom he was very close uh, indeed. At a young age, he, he was determined to um, educate himself, uh, and uh, he insisted 
that he go to University of Aligarh. His father was opposed to this. His father thought that a Nawab should not be educated at a public institution. But he had the support of his teacher uh, who ran the uh, Nawab school. And he had the support of his uncle uh, who was uh, close uh, to uh, Liaquat. And as a result of that, in 1910, um, uh, at the age of 14, he went to Aligarh, the Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College, as it was called at that time, of course. Uh, and uh, he spent the next eight years there. And he fully imbibed the Aligarh ethos. And throughout his life, he always quoted from the words of Sir Syed Ahmad Khan. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he, he embraced this modernist approach of Said Ahmad Khan, this melding of the cultures of East and West. He learned Persian. He became very fond of the Persian uh, language. He quoted from it uh, all his uh, life and in his speeches. Uh, and uh, uh, he always remained faithful and until the, the very end, of his life, even in 1950, when he was on a tour of the United States, he would quote from Said Ahmad Khan and the ethos of mixing East uh, and West uh, together, modern scientific learning based upon Islam. And he never lost this, uh, this uh, foundation. He studied jurisprudence. Uh, why he studied jurisprudence, why he chose the uh, Judas uh, uh, prudence, we have no record of that, except that he had a very, very legalistic frame of mind. And he always maintained this legalistic way of looking at things, a sometimes literal way uh, at uh, looking at, uh, uh, at things. This was recognized by many people. Once, Jinnah, who was in one of his uh, good moods there that day, was asked about some of the, of the people of the All Indian Muslim League. Uh, what are their characteristics? What are they like? And when he turned to Liakat, he said, well, with Liakat, if something came up, if an issue came up, what Liakat would do was to look at the rules and regulations of the All Indian Muslim League to see whether or not I could do something. This was a, an example of his uh, legalistic frame of mind. So it is perhaps for this reason that he chose uh, to study Jewish uh, prudence, which he did. By this time, we don't know exactly the date, but it is possible that he was married off to his first cousin, uh, Jahangira, uh, when he was um, uh, something like 18 years old. Uh, his uh, bride was his first cousin. Uh, she would have been a child bride at the age of 13, 12 or 13 at this time. But if he married at this time, he went back to Aligarh, finished up in Aligarh, and then returned to Karnal as a graduate of Aligarh. A year later, his son, Wilayat, was born. Uh, and, uh, and, and thus his uh, first family. He then went to Oxford. He wanted to, to, to study at uh, Oxford and education was always very, very important to him. Where this compulsion for education comes from, uh, uh, we don't know, difficult to say. Uh, Liakot never actually uh, spoke specifically about it. But all his life, he was devoted to the whole issue of education. And upon his return uh, from uh, England, from Oxford, uh, he became the president of the Anglo-Islamia school in Muzaffarnagar, and he made that, maintained that connection until 1947. He also became involved with the Anglo-Arabic college in New Delhi and became the president of the Anglo-Arabic society at some time in the 19, early 1940s. Exactly when? I have never been able to uh, find out, but he became the president and it became a venue for all Indian Muslim leagues. And of course, throughout all of these years, he was an old boy of Aligarh. 
He visited the, uni the college, now a university after 1920, on a regular basis. And very often when he would travel to Lucknow, he would leave Karnal, go to Aligarh, stay overnight in Aligarh, and then on to uh, Lucknow. And uh, he maintained this uh, connection with Aligarh uh, up until 1947 up until he giving his last speech in uh, uh, Aligarh in early 1947. Then Oxford. And uh, he, at this time, in 1919, his brother, his elder brother, Sajad Ali Khan, with whom he was very close, wanted him to join the Indian Civil Service and obtain special permission for uh, Liaquat uh, to be examined uh, into the uh, ICS uh, in uh, London uh, and for various other exceptions to the rules for him to be admitted. And Sajjad was very, very keen on this uh, and uh, arranged for all of the documentation uh, for this uh, in 1919. Liaquat, however, was on his way to London uh, and he arrived in London late 1919 to enter Oxford University in January of 1920. Uh, at that time, Oxford was uh, overcrowded. It was difficult to find a college. So for one year, he was in a non-affiliated uh, college. There were many, many uh, students, especially from South Asia, who were non-affiliated um, uh, students. It was cheaper that way. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and of course, people did not have to find um, a connection and affiliation with the college. But eventually, the year later, from January of 21, Liaquat was accepted into Exeter College. And according to some reports, uh, he was elated by this opportunity to be associated uh, with, a, uh, with a college. He graduated later that year um, in the Shorter School of Jurisprudence. While he was at Oxford, he was also enrolled at the Inner Temple in London. And he traveled up to London uh, to attend his uh, three dinners that established his residency in the, in the, in the inns of the court, the law courts of uh, London. Uh, and he traveled up uh, to London from Oxford to take his exams. All of the examination results were printed in the Times of London, uh, and uh, Liaquat's results were always pretty good, never the highest, but by no means uh, the uh, lowest. Uh, and so he was called to the bar uh, in uh, the summer, August of 1921. He spent the um, rest of the year, apparently, traveling in Europe. Exactly where he went uh, is, has been difficult to follow. It is more than likely that Liaquat wrote letters to his elder brother during this period, but none have come to light so far. Uh, of course, a lot of material was lost when the family moved from uh, Karnal in India to Pakistan in 1947. But uh, Liaquat supposedly traveled to, um, uh, to uh, Europe, around the Europe, returning to India at the end of the year of uh, 1921. His brother Sajjad traveled down to Bombay uh, to greet him, uh, to accompany him back to uh, Karnal. And uh, on the long train trip back, they had discussions about everything and anything, uh, as Sajjad recorded to Liaquat's first uh, biographer that one of the things that he remembered most about that long journey was the argument they had over whether or not Muslims should have more than one wife. Sajjad, of course, had several wives um, and uh, ended up having several wives. Uh, and um, uh, Liaquat was very much against having many, many wives. And Sajjad also commented that he came back to India very westernized. His mother also talked about his this period 
uh, she gave a well publicized um, interview to the press in India after his murder, after his assassination. And she said that when he came back to India, he was passionately fond of three things, singing, um, entertaining, and politics. Do, while he was at Oxford, he had written to his brother, telling him that he was very, very sorry indeed, and he hoped he would forgive him, but there was no way that he could serve this British imperial administration by joining the Indian Civil Service. Several people have recorded their uh, comments uh, uh, about him, and these comments are ones that people said about him all their lives. Indian politicians, Indian figures, as well as Western diplomats, um, Belgian ambassadors, Burmese ambassadors, uh, people from East and West. What they all said about the Akat from his young age up until his death was his imperturbability, his calmness, his self-confidence. Everybody talked about his self-confidence. At the same time uh, as this, he was also rather shy. Uh, and uh, there were these two sides of this. People recorded that he could be a genial host and he was a wonderful host. He could be the soul uh, of the party. But at the same time, he had this shyness aspect of them. He did not like the limelight. And in fact, in, 19, in, in one uh, meeting of the All India Muslim League, the leaders of the league were supposed to go in procession down the streets to the meeting. Liakat wrote to his wife, I ran away uh, to avoid this uh, publicity. Um, Jinnah was in the parade, uh, Fazlul Haq was in the parade, and other members were in the parade, but Liakat essentially hid himself uh, because he did not like the limelight. When he was asked by Jinnah to be the uh, General Secretary of the All India Muslim League, likewise, he told Jinnah uh, that, you know, he was not really one for the limelight uh, and uh, he should reconsider it. We know that Jinnah insisted and over time, Liakat came out of his shell uh, to be a, a, a public figure. But this was Liakat, uh, his personality. He also had a love of gadgets. His wife, Rana, said that he loved gadgets of all kinds. He collected cigarette lighters. Of course, he joked, well, I was looking for one darn thing that would work. Uh, but he was also fond of cameras. He loved photography. There are a few photographs of uh, Liakat with his cameras, and he has this great look of calmness and peace and satisfaction on his face when he is taking these photographs. Unfortunately, he liked to take photographs on glass slides. And while there are hundreds in the uh, family archives, they have all just um, um, crumbled away and we can't see what these photographs were. But he returned uh, to uh, India uh, for a life of service. He enrolled as uh, a member of the bar in London. He went to Lahore, Lower Mall. He registered as a lawyer in the Lahore High Court, but uh, he never um, uh, practiced uh, law. He never developed a law practice. Instead, he devoted his life to service, education, and to politics. By this time, of course, he was a wealthy man. His father had died in 1918, leaving the elder brother, Sajad, Liakat, who was the eldest son of the second wife, and Sadakat Ali Khan was the son of the third wife, leaving these three half brothers with a big inheritance. Liakat's inheritance was something like a hundred thousand rupees a year. 
which translated into about eight to 10,000 rupees per month. And he lived a luxurious life, both in Oxford, where he lived on Ifley Road, opposite the, uh, the track, the famous track where Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile. He lived in this nice apartment. His, his fellow students remembered his uh, luxurious entertainment during this period. And it, it also possible that this time he bought himself a nice luxury car to travel around uh, in. But he returned to um, Karnal, to his wife, to his son, who is now about three, four years old, and very westernized. The family remembered that uh, he insisted that his wife stop wearing the purda or stop being in purda, stop wearing burqa and wearing a sari. He insisted that when they went on a train trip, uh, she not wear, not to cover herself in the burqa, but uh, wear Western clothing in or sari. This uh, greatly upset his wife, greatly upset the family. And I was once fortunate enough to interview uh, Sadakat Ali Khan, Liakat's uh, younger half brother. And he said, I remember now as if it were yesterday, uh, the, the outrage that this caused uh, in the family and how it split the family, that he wanted his wife to be a westernized, modernized uh, woman. Uh, and uh, uh, it did not go down very well, neither with his wife, nor with her family, nor with Liakat's family. Um, but this is, this is the kind of person he had, uh, uh, he had uh, become. He ran for local elections in Carnell municipality. And then in 1923 came a life-saving, a life-changing um, activity, a life-changing uh, event. Uh, and that was the uh, 1923 general election. When Liaka stood for the Legislative Assembly of India. And he stood for election to the Legislative Assembly from Punjab, from rural district in Punjab. He lost the election. But I think if he had won the election, his whole life would have been different. He would have become associated, I suspect, with the uh, Punjab Unionist Party. He was an agriculturalist uh, and uh, he uh, supported uh, agricultural uh, parties. Uh, and uh, I strongly suspect that he would have fitted in very well with the uh, agriculturalist party. However, he lost that election. And his, his, as a result of that, I think that the trajectory of his life changed. His next attempt at, at politics was not in the Punjab, but in the UP, from his uh, family lands, family estate in Muzaffarnagar. And it is from, the, from Muzaffarnagar that he becomes associated with the UP politics. And he becomes something of a UP wala, UP person, and is associated with the, with the UP. But he maintained his home in Karnal, lived there most of the time, although he had a fine house in Muzaffarnagar called Kakashan, which is on the, um, on the, on the, the main road uh, in uh, Muzaffarnagar. Uh, and it is, in the, it is in the UP Legislative Council that he made his name, that he becomes renowned and he becomes, uh, he becomes uh, quite uh, famous. Uh, he is associated, first of all, with the United Provinces Zamindars Association. A, move, a, 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 a group of agriculturalists, Hindus and Muslims who, fur, who furthered the interest of agriculturists in the UP. When he was, um, he ran for election in 26 as an independent. When he was elected into the uh, Legislative Council, he set up his own political party. This party he called the Democratic Party. Um, the newspapers in the UP delighted in calling them tea parties 
because they only had enough members uh, to meet for tea. But uh, his Democratic Party was made up of Hindus and Muslims. It was a, um, a, a party with no religious affiliation. Uh, and this became his uh, uh, leap motif. Uh, and he began his career in the UP Legislative Council. And it is through his speeches that we can find out about, about him, his life, his interests. He always spoke about how it was essential for the majority community, the Hindus, to be magnanimous, to look after the minorities. And he was seen as a non-communal figure. And in 1931, he was voted to be the deputy president of the Legislative uh, Council. Prior to that, he had, always, he had been a representative uh, of the uh, Legislative uh, Council to various um, agencies, including to the Mirut cons uh, conspiracy case when they in in uh, set up a committee to inquire into it, an official committee. Liakat was appointed um, to be one of its uh, members. And so he was re-elected to the Legislative Council, continued that until the 1936 um, election. And of course, in the 1936 elections, this was a turning point in Indian history uh, and uh, a turning point in Liaquat Ali Khan's life, as well as a turning point in other people's lives uh, as well. At first, of course, Congress was not expected to win the elections of 1936. At least, this is what the British reported. And it seemed to be the case. For this reason, Congress and the Muslim League entered into some kind of uh, uh, agreement. And before the elections, uh, uh, Muslim League figures, Chaudhuri Kalikuzaman and Ismail Khan were expected to be in the cabinet uh, in the future. But all of this was before the election. But because Congress was not expected to win the elections, the British um, governor, Haig, and then afterwards Hallett, sided with the landlords uh, and uh, they pinned their hope on the National Agriculturist Party. The National Agriculturist Party was led by Nawab Chatari, among others. There were two or three. The party itself was uh, somewhat divided uh, and uh, as usual, there was a Hindu faction and there was a Muslim uh, faction. But Nawab of Chatari had served as the acting governor of the UP. He was considered to be the um, leading Muslim figure of the province. And many people expected the National Agriculturist Party to come out of the election, the leading party, and to form the um, government after at the elections. Liakat was one of them. He was um, part of the National Agriculturist Party, uh, as well as his own Democratic Party, as well as his own United Province Zamindars Association. Uh, and uh, he was Chatari's man. Chatari and he were uh, close uh, and they would meet later on, they would meet from time to time. Uh, Chatari after, um, after the elections, of course, uh, Congress refused to enter into the government of the UP in a well-known story. Uh, and they, so they wanted to set up an interim government. Liakat, uh, before the elections, as Chatari's man, had been offered the position of assistant secretary of the National Agriculturist Party. He thought that this was beneath him to be an assistant secretary of the party. So they made him the treasurer. And he duly opened up um, an account in uh, the, um, the bank in, and uh, in, in uh, Muzaffanaga of the National Agriculturist Party, Alarabad, and kept the party uh, finances, uh, dished out money uh, to the party for their campaign in 1937, uh, a tardy campaign a not particularly well organized uh, campaign. The landlords 
as was um, revealed in many of the uh, British uh, documents of the time, the landlords relied upon their old ways to um, mobilize the voters through their influence, through the local power, powerful men, through the influential men. And they did not see the necessity for getting out into the countryside uh, and for uh, uh, appealing directly to the people uh, to put pressure on those people who had the vote uh, to vote. Congress was the opposite. Congress was well organized. They had this dynamo of a campaigner in Jawaharlal Nehru, a remarkable man in, in many senses, a remarkable energy who could work for hours and hours uh, on end, and he did. Uh, and partly as a result of his um, uh, efforts, Congress, of course, was very, very successful uh, in, in the UP. The whole question then came up of whether Congress would accept office. And as we know, they did not. They did not want to at first. And so then Nawab Chitari was offered by the governor to set up a, a cabinet, uh, and as it turned out, an interim a cabinet, an interim government, even though they didn't like the, this term. And at this stage, Chitari offered Liaquat, according to his brother, Sajad, Liaquat was offered a cabinet position uh, in this interim government led by Chatari. Liaquat thought that this was, uh, this was uh, be, uh, totally unacceptable. Uh, and uh, later on in a letter to his wife, he thought that uh, Chatari, in his words, had been selfish to accept office on these on these terms. Well, for Liaka, he was not involved in the main events of the rest of 1937, the summer and the fall of 19, the autumn of 1937, because he was in London. Liaka had always been interested in finances, in economics. He was something of a conservative economist always believing in a balanced budget. His first committee that he served on after being elected in 1926 was on a finance committee. Uh, and he always spoke at great length on finance matters in the Legislative Council. Uh, and because of this interest, the British nominated him to be part of the Indo-British trade negotiations, which uh, set up a committee uh, uh, and uh, headed by uh, Zafarullah Khan, uh, the finance member, uh, and uh, they met in India before going to London in nine, summer of 1937 to finalize the uh, conditions uh, of trade between India uh, and uh, Great Britain, which would lead in, uh, to 1939 to the Indo-British Trade Agreement. But so Liaquat was in London and he was there for five months, a long period of time. He missed the Sikandar Jinnat Pact. Uh, he missed the events of 1937. He kept close watch on them in the newspapers. Uh, and, and it was during this period that he wrote constantly uh, to uh, um, his wife, uh, and uh, it is through some of these letters that we learn some of the ideas of uh, Liaquat. And this brings into the, into the picture the woman who became the love of his life, Irene Margaret Punt, from Almora in uh, the United Provinces. Uh, she was related to Govin Bala Punt, who was the, uh, lead, one of the leading figures uh, in the United uh, Provinces uh, politics and became the leading figure of United Provinces. The family story is that, uh, that, uh, that uh, it was the grandfather who converted from Hinduism to um, Christianity. And this story is uh, shown uh, in a, a nice uh, volume, uh, recent volume on Irene uh, Margaret Pant called Begum, 
uh, by Deepa Agawal and Tamina Aziz Ayub. Uh, and uh, the story is that the family became involved in medicine. They became involved in education. Uh, and I, and um, Irene Margaret uh, was not the eldest daughter, but she was uh, um, one of the daughters of this uh, large family. Uh, and uh, because of the family tradition, she was a well-educated uh, woman, uh, went to Isabella Thorborn College uh, in Lucknow, received a BA, which obviously uh, in the 1930s or late 1920s, was uh, unusual. Uh, and then uh, she went to Lucknow University uh, in the MA uh, program. Uh, the only uh, woman in her MA class where she had to put up with a huge amount of teasing, Eve teasing uh, from the boys. Uh, she would leave the classroom and both of the tires of a bicycle would be deflated and she'd have to walk the bicycle home or somehow get me inflated. But she wrote her dissertation on women agricultural workers in the United Provinces, the kind of subject that uh, Liakot was also interested in. They met in 1928 by accident uh, and uh, Liakot uh, appreciated this uh, beautiful, young, highly energetic, uh, highly energetic woman uh, and uh, he never forgot her. She then went on to Calcutta uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, studied to become a teacher, taught in, um, taught in Calcutta, uh, and then got a job at the Indra Pastor College uh, in uh, Delhi. And when the Akhat was um, elected the deputy president of the United Provinces Legislative Council, Irene Margaret wrote to her to congratulate him on it. And this began a relationship that eventually led up to a close relationship. They traveled to a number of cities together, uh, a number of trips together, finally marrying uh, in 1933 uh, uh, after she converted to Islam. By converting to Islam, she broke with her father, or rather her father broke with her, and it seems her father uh, never admitted her into his presence again uh, because of her, uh, her marrying a, a Muslim. But this was a real love relationship. Liaquat uh, became totally uh, fascinated uh, by her, um, madly in love with her, and it is fr uh, from in 1937, in his letters, uh, that uh, he expresses this uh, great love for her. Um, sweetheart mine, dearest mine, love of my life, uh, all of these kind of phrases in his, uh, uh, in his uh, letters. Uh, and uh, uh, she became known as Rana Liaquat Ali Khan, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, he was exceedingly generous to her. This, of course, caused something of a disruption in the family. She was the second wife, uh, and Liaquat was exceptionally generous to her. She worried about her position in the family. She worried about finances. She worried about her status. Uh, and uh, and uh, Liaquat always, uh, in his letters to her, tried to reassure her, uh, to comfort her. And he was always very exceedingly generous uh, to her. Um, his magnificent house in Muzaffarnagar, for example, he gave to her as her uh, personal property. Later on, uh, from about 1936, they were to spend 60 to 70,000 rupees buying a property in New Delhi, which became their house in uh, uh, New Delhi, it became known as Gul, Gul, Gulirana. Uh, and he gifted this to her as well. Uh, so he was exceedingly generous to her. And he was very, very um, um, solicitous uh, to her, uh, always watching out for her reputation uh, and, 
uh, and uh, uh, and uh, very very close to her. Uh, he adored her, uh, and uh, it's perhaps not too much to say uh, that she was the dominant one of the relationship. He may you could even say he was a usurious uh, uh, husband. But this is the figure of Rana Liaquat Ali Khan, who became the most important person in his life. By this time, he had become, it seems, totally estranged from his uh, first wife. Um, several years before, the, before his marriage to Rana, uh, he had separated from his wife, lived in different uh, houses, uh, uh, and he devoted all of his emotions uh, to this uh, second uh, uh, wife. So, Liakad, up until 1937, had had a success, very successful career. He had been recognized by the British. Uh, he had been uh, elected deputy president of the uh, Legislative uh, Council. He had been appointed to various uh, uh, committees and uh, uh, programs by, by the British, regularly as a deputy president, uh, invited to dinner, sometimes along with all of the other legislators, sometimes with small groups by the governor of the UP. And before the elections, Leaka, and he stated so in some of his speeches, he looked forward to the future. He thought the future was good. He anticipated office at the cabinet level. He anticipated um, a bright political future at the center of events. He returned to India uh, at the end of uh, 1937 uh, after the, and while he was away, Rana had, been, had given birth to their first son, Ashraf, in October of 1937. Uh, and uh, uh, so he returned to a second family uh, and this family became very, very uh, dear to him. But the whole situation had changed. And here, of course, I am following the, uh, the um, fairly standard line about how events in the UP between 1937 and 1939 were so pivotal in the history uh, of, the, of the British Raj and how it dramatically changed the situation. And this is certainly reflected in uh, in uh, Liakat's uh, uh, in uh, Liakat's uh, case, uh, in which uh, in which far from being expected to play a, a big role in the politics of the province, his career came to a crashing halt, and he was very conscious of this. He had been uh, elected to the UP Legislative Assembly uh, as an independent not as a member of the Muslim League. He was not a member of the Muslim League at this time. A whole group of uh, Muslim politicians asked Chaudhuri Kalikuzaman, who along with Ismail Khan was the leader of the Muslim League in, uh, in the UP. The other rival for the leadership of the party was Salampur, Raja of Salampur. But a whole group of Muslims asked Kalikuzaman if they could join the Muslim League and sit on the benches in the Legislative Assembly uh, with the Muslim League. Kalikuzaman consulted his party people and they said, no. You had stood for election on a different party, on the National Agriculturist Party, uh, uh, and so no. You can't join the Muslim League. You can't join us on our benches. Liakad asked to do the same thing. Kalikuzaman said yes. And he did so according to his uh, biography, um, autobiography, uh, on the basis that Liakad had stood as an independent and not as a party. And that is how Liakad finally, although he said, according to one of his speeches, he had been a member of the All India Muslim League since 1923. He had attended uh, a meeting of the All India Muslim League in Calcutta in 1928. 
when he met Jinnah and he sided with Jinnah when Jinnah was uh, defeated over the issue of separate uh, electorates. Uh, and uh, uh, Liaokat sided with Jinnah over this issue. So it seems as though Jinnah knew about Liaokat from about 1928. In 1933, Liaokat went to London uh, to speak uh, as one of the committees from the Roundtable Conferences. Uh, and uh, uh, on the issue of, uh, of the uh, constituencies. Uh, and there he met Jinnah in Hampstead uh, in 1933. He had met him at a party uh, and then Jinnah invited him to his home in Hampstead and they made a connection uh, in 1933 uh, as a result of his, his being in, in, uh, uh, in uh, London. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, Jinnah asked him in 1936 to be the General Secretary of the All India Muslim League. At first, Liaquat was totally surprised, he told Jinnah, as I mentioned, I don't like the limelight. I don't like to be in, in the public eye, the publicity. So uh, maybe you should uh, think about it. But Jinnah apparently uh, insisted. Liaquat said he would consult with his wife Irene, Margaret, uh, by this name Rana, he would consult with Rana uh, and give him his decision. As we know, he said yes, and he became the General Secretary of the party from 1936 and maintained that position until uh, 1947. Uh, this is a picture of him at Oxford, where he lived a scrupulously extravagant life, as one person uh, said it, with his top hat, uh, his spats, uh, and his uh, elegant, uh, uh, elegant clothing. He also played tennis uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, lived, the, lived the, 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 uh, a fine life. In 1933, when he was in London, uh, he spent, they spent, uh, and this was a delayed honeymoon for uh, um, uh, Lana, and he uh, and they spent four to five months uh, in uh, England and in Europe. And uh, this is a picture of them uh, in uh, Cambridge. Um, I can reverse what uh, Nehru said and say that when uh, Leacob was Oxford, he had heard of Cambridge, but he took her uh, to um, um, Cambridge. They then went on the continent this is a picture of them in Berlin, by this time Hitler's Berlin, Nazi Berlin. They then went on to Venice, uh, to, uh, to uh, Italy, before uh, returning back um, to India uh, sometime towards uh, the end of the year. But this was the, and 1937 to 39, was a turning point because in following the normal trajectory, this is a period that changed people's viewpoints. And Liaquat Ali Khan's viewpoint, his perspective changed dramatically. In the, in the, in the period between 20, 27 uh, and uh, 38, he had always spoken in the Legislative Council as a non-communal figure. He had never emphasized his uh, uh, Muslim identity. He had never spoken out about uh, the interest of uh, Muslims, although he always spoke about the necessity to, de to look after all of the less privileged people. Uh, and in some ways, he was a, a man of the people. Uh, and uh, uh, all of this, and, and he was known for being a non-communal figure. People never heard him uh, be a Muslim spokesman. All of this changed between 39, uh, between 37 and 39. Uh, and he increasingly associated with the Muslim League. And of course, Muslims uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, 
uh, in the UP and other parts of India objected very, very strongly to what Congress was advocating, what Congress had done. They saw it as Hinduization of uh, India, Brahmin domination, uh, Sanskritic domination uh, of India. Uh, they objected to the singing of Vande Mataram. They ad ad uh, objected to the educational system, the water scheme of uh, education, uh, known as the Vidya Mandir scheme of education in the central uh, provinces. They objected to uh, the, uh, to waving the, uh, the the Congress flag. They objected to the deification uh, of uh, of Gandhi. And the result of this was the increasing uh, polarization of the communities in India, especially between the Muslim community and the, the Hindu uh, community. And the Akhat was in the center of this. Of course, this communalization was part and parcel of British rule. The round table conferences, of course, had called for representatives of the Hindus, representatives of the Muslims, representatives of the Sikhs, representatives of the Christians, representatives of business communities. So this was nothing new, but of course it coincided at the same time with the increasing um, polarization, with the increasing Hinduization, if you like, uh, with the increasing extremity, uh, particularly of Hindu organizations. Uh, and all of these things, the um, Muslims objected to, as they objected to the loss of the use of Urdu. Uh, this became a big issue in the water scheme of education of whether or not Urdu would be used or whether it would be the vernacular languages, which is what Gandhi always uh, advocated. Uh, and uh, uh, they, add, they, they objected to the kind of curriculum that Congress was advocating in the water scheme of education. So there were many issues that alienated Muslims uh, during this, uh, this period. And of course, as we know well, it became known as Hindu Raj. Uh, Muslims uh, thought that this was extreme. And Liaquat was one of those group of people. Kali Kuzaman, Ismail Khan, Liaquat, Raja of Mahmudabad in particular. This group of people who made up the cadre of the All India Muslim League. It was they who served on its committees, who became important in the Committee of Action, who became important uh, in the National Guards, who be uh, funded by Mahmudabad. It became, they became important uh, in all of the, the, commi the Committee of Action, the Working Committee, uh, all of these committees. And the Pakistan movement itself was spearheaded by and uh, by the UP, by these people from the UP. None more important than the General Secretary of the All Indian Muslim League, Liaquat Ali Khan. And uh, he had become totally alienated uh, from his confrères in the Legislative Assembly of India. He began to speak up, speak out, uh, uh, as a Muslim spokesman, and this was very unusual for him. And it became a matter of record in the Legislative Assembly of India. In one of the uh, debates in 1939, one of the speakers said, is this the Liaquat that we used to know? He is not the Liaquat of yesterday. It's hard for us to, to listen to this person who has changed so dramatically. Liak had interrupted the speaker to say, no, I am the same. I am where I was, but he wasn't um, because the situation had totally uh, changed. And at this time, 
Muslim identity was solidifying in North India, particularly uh, in the UP. And from the late, from 1938, of course, in the correspondence between Iqbal, he died, of course, in April of 1938, but in that correspondence in the, in the one or two years prior to uh, his death, Iqbal wrote to Jinnah, uh, telling him he had to defend Muslim civilization. It is not a question of jobs. It is not a we're not doing this for, uh, we're not doing this to, to find work for people. It's not just that. It is, it is Muslim culture. It is Muslim civilization. And Iqbal began to talk in these terms. Jinnah began to talk in these terms. And it was from 1938 that they began to talk about the need for a sovereign state for Muslims in South Asia. They never deviated from this. Liaquat too, when he gave one of his speeches at a local conference in the UP in 1938, also began talking about how they needed to create uh, their own state. They needed to create their own state uh, to, to defend Muslim uh, civilization. And he realized this, and, uh, and, and his work in the All India Muslim League um, confirmed this. He told Jinnah in 1939, we need a newspaper. We need a newspaper to, uh, to get our, uh, our message, message across. Jinnah agreed with him, but not until two years later. And this was one of Liaquat's major uh, contributions. So the, the 37 to 39 period saw a fundamental shift in Liaquat's rhetoric, in his world view, in the belief, as Jinnah was saying, that this constitution of 1935, the government of India of 1935, was unsuited for India. We are in a, Muslims are in a perpetual minority. We cannot depend upon the majority to look after our interests. And he never deviated from this, uh, uh, from this uh, perspective. The, the next period of Liaquat's life is as a national figure. Begins in 1939, the day of deliverance, for example, in 1939, ended Congress rule uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, Liaquat devoted himself to national affairs with the Muslim League. And then finally in 1941, he entered the Legislative Assembly of India in a by-election for the previous member imprisoned. Uh, and he ran unopposed in 1941, early, early uh, 1941. And he finally arrived in the Legislative Assembly of India, much later than he intended. Um, almost 20 years later than he intended, but he uh, became a member of the Legislative Assembly. Jinnah appointed him his deputy president uh, and slowly Liaquat became known uh, as a national figure. Um, he was known to many Muslims. He traveled, he had previously traveled to all parts of India on behalf of the All India Muslim League, but he was not uh, as renowned as Kali Kuzaman, Ismail Khan, and the others. In the governor's uh, fortnightly reports, for example, between 1937 and 1939, Liaquat is only mentioned once, uh, and that is in reference uh, to the negotiations with Chatari uh, in April of 1937. So he did not figure very much, but it is in from 1941 that he increasingly becomes known uh, as a national uh, figure. Um, the All India Muslim League, of course, sets up a whole series of committees, the Working Committee, the um, uh, um, a Committee of Action, uh, it sets up a Writers Committee, and Liaquat is at the center of all of these activities. He is corresponding with Jinnah all of the time. 
Dawn newspaper is created uh, in 1941 as a weekly. Lee Alcott is the managing editor. He negotiates all of the salaries. He negotiates with the British government for paper. He negotiates to buy a press from America uh, to, uh, to uh, print uh, this press during wartime uh, shortages. He travels all over India. Congress accused Muslim League of being simply uh, a party, a small party of the northern part of uh, India. No representation in the south. Liaquat embarks upon a tiring trip of the south of India in order to take the Muslim League uh, to the south of India. Widely publicized in, in, the, uh, uh, in the newspapers. So these are his activities. Jinnah is sometimes uh, absent from the Legislative Assembly of India. Uh, Jinnah, of course, maintains his very, very profitable law practice, where he is one of the few Indians to pay the super tax uh, um, uh, of, of, of India. Uh, and he continues his law practice. Uh, Jinnah, of course, by this time has been suffering from cancer uh, for uh, several years. Uh, was diagnosed in the late 1930s. He is sometimes ill uh, and he is sometimes frequent from the Legislative Assembly of India. Liaquat becomes the de facto leader of the Muslim League uh, in the Legislative Assembly of India. He becomes close to Desai, uh, the Congress leader. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, of course, uh, they create this desire Liaquat Pact of 1945, which has caused a great deal of controversy uh, at the time and afterwards, um, because this was a so-called pact that assured equality uh, between the two parties. And it seemed as though the Muslim League had given up its demand for Pakistan and was willing to enter into a government on an equal basis with, uh, with the uh, Congress. Um, so it was controversial, but it became uh, the basis of the interim government uh, of 1946. And of course, at first, the Muslim League refused to enter into the interim government. Coming out of the 1945 elections, the general elections, which were a huge success for the Muslim League, which won almost all of the seats that it contested. In reality, as some historians have written, the League was in a very weak position. Congress was saying to the British, look, give us power, just hand over power. Once power is handed over, we'll set up a constitution, a constituent assembly, and we will take care of the constitution. We will take care of the uh, minorities. Uh, and uh, this is what the League was afraid of, uh, that this is exactly what the British would, do, would uh, do. But of course, the 1945 elections were a very great success, and in part, because of Aligarh Muslim University. Liaquat's alma mater, he went to Aligarh before the elections and he told the students, you must come out of the university. You must campaign for us. Uh, and uh, if that means giving up a year of your studies, it's important for Pakistan. Many people did not really know what Pakistan meant or what it signified, but the response was very good. Congress in 1945 were determined to defeat Liaquat in his uh, constituency, and they threw everything that they had uh, in his defeat. The League responded, uh, Liaquat responded by campaigning uh, in the middle constituency uh, where he was running for office. Large numbers of Aligarh students helped him, supported him, so many that eventually Liaquat was had to write back to Aligarh saying, 
don't send any more students. I don't know what to do with them. We don't know what to do with them. But it was a great success. And Aligarh was the, the um, arsenal of the, of the Pakistan movement. And Liaquat was, was uh, responsible for this, along with Ziauddin Ahmed. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it was a great success. Nonetheless, the League was afraid that the British would simply hand over power to Congress. Uh, and uh, this is what they could have done. Uh, and this was always a, a, a great threat to them. And the um, cabinet mission, uh, the interim government has led to a great deal of writing on it, some confusion about it. When the Muslim League accepted the cabinet mission plan, did they do so out of a genuine concern, a genuine desire that they did not wish to create a separate sovereign state, which China had been calling for since 1938 because it was simply a negotiation to get a better deal, as some people have argued? Or was the acceptance of the cabinet mission plan and their final entry into the interim government simply a strategy to that end? I think it was a strategy to that end. Uh, and that, that the very, because the Congress were, were telling the British, Nehru was telling the British, look, Muslim League have not cooperated. How can you negotiate with these people? They're not serious. They're not taking part in the government. So when Jinnah and the League did not take part in the interim government in the beginning, Congress said, yes, look at these people. They're not going to cooperate with them. They're not going to take part in the, uh, in the government. You can't trust these people. Uh, just hand over power, we'll take everything. Uh, and of course, eventually, I think the League realized their mistake in not entering the interim government. So Liaquat entered the interim government as the finance member. Um, several other people did too enter into the interim government. And this led to Liaquat's poor man's budget of 1947. All of the documentation that I've seen says that Liaquat was the, the, the architect behind this, the person who wrote uh, all of this but it alienated uh, Congress. Uh, and uh, as we know, Mountbatten became the, um, uh, became the um, governor general, the viceroy, and he, I think, rushed things through. You can follow this, of course, in uh, Ziegler's uh, book, Mountbatten. Uh, Iqbal Chola of the University of Punjab is coming up with a book on Mountbatten shortly. We shall read that with interest. But Mountbatten pushed through the events of uh, partition, uh, and all of these can be followed in the transfer of power uh, uh, papers. Um, but uh, Liaquat played a very important role then uh, in helping push the demand for Pakistan, publicizing the publicizing the um, uh, movement for Pakistan. And uh, this, and of course, he developed a very close relationship with, with Jinnah. Uh, this photograph indicates the role of Jinnah, collecting his papers uh, and uh, publishing the speeches of Jinnah. Uh, it was his uh, role. Uh, they were uh, close together. Um, Zafarullah Khan wrote, in his memoirs that Liaquat was very, very close to Jinnah. Jinnah looked very kindly on uh, Liaquat. There was a 20 year difference in their age. Um, Liaquat was always very, very um, careful of his relationship with uh, Jinnah. Uh, and uh, um, I think it's reasonably fair to say he, he not only respected the man, but he idealized, ide, uh, idealized the man. Uh, and uh, they were often side by side. Uh, 
the relationship was often the four of them, Rana, Liakat Ali Khan, and Fatima Jinnah. Fatima and Rana did not get along well together. Uh, Fatima resented Rana's prominence, as she later as she later said, and didn't understand why uh, she was so much prominent. Uh, the closest they ever came to their relationship was when they went together uh, to Kashmir. They rented houseboats up in Kashmir, uh, and this is uh, um, Dina Wadia, Jinnah's daughter, of course, who has recently passed away. Uh, and this was the closest they ever came. However, Jinnah was always very, very correct in his relationships. Uh, and uh, Liakad always addressed him as dear Mr. Jinnah uh, and uh, always showed him the greatest respect. In 45, uh, Jinnah took Liakad to London with him for nego last ditch negotiations uh, and Pakistan was created. And when Pakistan was created, um, uh, of course, there were several issues. Government, which Ian Tolbert has recently talked about in a talk uh, to the society uh, about the diplomatic relations uh, between uh, Pakistan and uh, Great Britain, and of how the government of Pakistan had to be founded from scratch. Liaquat was responsible for the creation of a sound government. Uh, and uh, 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 in 1947, the wags of, of New Delhi were joking that Pakistan would collapse uh, like a tent. Within weeks, within months, they were supposedly taking bets on it. It didn't. It was well organized. The Pakistan government has finally released the cabinet papers for Liaquat's period. Some of them have become available. And what they indicate is that the Yarkat was the center of everything that the Pakistan government did in the first four years. Jinnu, of course, for the first year was the figurehead, but it was the Yarkat doing all of the work. Their huge problem, as we all know, was refugees and refugees continue to come in to Pakistan for years not just in 46, 47, 48, but also in 49. Kashmir was their biggest problem. Kashmir, um, Liaquat was determined or trying to bring this to the United Nations to let them decide. And they had, he has voluminous correspondence with Nehru. And he was trying to maneuver Nehru through this correspondence which, as I mentioned, has now been released by the Pakistan government to maneuver him into taking the whole issue into the United Nations and letting them decide and to have a plebiscite. And the vote would then, of course, um, vote in favor of Pakistan, or so he thought. Nehru resisted this, of course, and the vote has never been held. The Objectives Resolution of 1949 was the preamble to the to the a constitution. Some people have regarded this as a concession to extremist Muslims and extremist Islamic thoughts, uh, but it remains a part of the constitution uh, um, today. Uh, and of course, here some people have blamed him for siding with the United States and uh, Canada and not going to Russia. Um, however, this is a misunderstanding. Liakat wanted to go to Russia. He wanted to establish diplomatic relationships with the Soviet Union, uh, which he did, which they did. He wanted the Soviet Union to pressure India to concede in Kashmir. It was the Russians and not Liakat uh, Ali Khan who delayed. Rana, in fact, had already bought, bought herself a nice warm winter coat uh, for their trip to Russia but it never came off. Instead, he made a trip to the United States to establish uh, relationships and to bring uh, Canada, uh, Pakistan into the Western uh, sphere. He became known as a defiant figure vis-a-vis -vis India, uh, much criticized by the army. He had a warm 
family relationship, the second son, Akba, who has just had, um, who recently passed his uh, 80th birthday, uh, was born in 1941, and this was a warm relationship. A picture with Truman, they both got along very well together. Liaquat begged Truman, he begged the British, he begged Australia for weapons, uh, especially airplanes, to try to fight India in the case of a war with Kashmir. It never happened. Uh, they never did. Um, in 1950, uh, he traveled to India uh, to meet with Nehru on the right uh, and uh, Vallabhai Patel uh, on the uh, left uh, to sign a, a no war pact, which upset many of the people of, uh, of, of uh, Pakistan. Uh, and uh, of, he loved cameras, he loved taking pictures, he loved gadgets of all kinds, devoted to his wife, which was this, the cause of the only bust up between Jinnah uh, and Liaquat uh, and, uh, in late 1947. Liaquat, I don't know if you can hear this, was assassinated That terrible day of 16th of October of 1951, when he was assassinated. Uh, and uh, in 1947, he went to Aligarh one last time uh, for convocation. Uh, and his final words at Aligarh, he quoted uh, from uh, this uh, poem of the 19th century, American. For once, he did not quote Said Ahmed Khan. He did not quote Iqbal. He did not quote Jinnah, he quoted an American. God give us men a time like this demands, strong minds, great hearts, true faith and ready hands. Men whom the lust of office does not kill, men whom the spoils of office cannot buy, men who possess opinions and the will, men who have honor, men who will not lie. And I think that characterizes uh, his personality, his beliefs. One word which was used at that time was unpurchasable, unpurchasable. And Liaquat was truly uh, unpurchasable, idealistic um, and uh, devoted to the causes. Um, one previous biographer has used the words of Oratio, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, how sweet it is to die for one's country. And I think that is a fitting epitaph also for Liaquat. For Liaquat was in considerable measure responsible for the creation of Pakistan and its survival. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and if we can just ask you to uh, stop uh, sharing the screen, I think. Okay, we'll do that. Click on that. I think we can go back. You see the... Will that work? Um, no, well, it's... it's so th there should be a, um, is there a green bar sort of at the top uh, of your screen? No, no. Uh, I've got new, sh new, new share at the bottom. Okay, hang on, I think I can do it for you. Okay, there we go. Okay, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Really? Great. Apologies. No, 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 it's fine. Thank you so much. Um, and we have um, a few um, questions here. Uh, one question was asking when, when your book is coming out. <laughs> Um, I did one book, uh, 2005, which is on the speeches uh, of Liaquat Ali Khan from OUP. Um, my study currently has become so voluminous, uh, I'm thinking of making it into three different volumes on his life. Uh, and uh, so uh, I'm hoping to finish this first volume uh, this, this, this next year, uh, and hopefully it will come out next year. Well, I, I hope to, I plan to follow that with other volumes on Liaka's life. 
Well, I think you have an audience waiting from the right. chat that yeah. we have here. And I hope so. We've got probably time for um, one question. Um, is that, um, uh, sorry, I've just lost it. Um, what do you think that uh, Liakat would have had the same sort of career or the same sort of effect without uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah? This is one of the questions here. It in fact says, what do you think about Liakat without Jinnah? Probably not, no. Uh, I think that uh, Liakat would have remained uh, probably a provincial politician. Uh, he talked about uh, provincial politics. He talked about how he did not like the limelight. Uh, he did not like publicity. He was a private man. Uh, and one of the statements that he made when he was prime minister was, uh, at the end of the day, I am not a wise man of the East. I am a simple person. At the end of the day, I go to my home and I sit there in quiet and listen. Uh, and uh, and this, uh, uh, this, so no, I don't think he probably would have. It's all conjecture, of course, but. Uh, Thank you. And we have another question. Um, how do you understand Liaquat's relationship with the civil bureaucracy and the military in Pakistan? With the civil bureaucracy, which was uh, ruled by Chaudhary Muhammad Ali, he had a very, very good relationship. Many of the um, uh, bureaucrats of the Pakistan civil service uh, came from India. Uh, and uh, Liaquat was very much an organization man. Uh, and he, um, uh, and, uh, he had a good uh, relationship uh, with, the, with the civil service. The army was more difficult. Um, of course, in the beginning, the army was headed by British officers and Liaquat was blamed for all of these British officers uh, running the Pakistan army, uh, General Gracie on down, Jefford running the uh, air force uh, and many Pakistani uh, army officers who were from the area of Pakistan, Punjab, Northwest Frontier Province, uh, they resented the British officers in the Pakistan uh, army. It, it stopped their promotion, they thought. They felt they, did, they deserved quicker promotion. Liaquat, of course, appointed Ayub Khan to be the commander in chief of the army. And when Liaquat visited the uh, um, United States in 1950, he said, you know, the uh, nationalization of the army is almost complete. Almost all of the officers in the Pakistan army are now Pakistanis. Uh, but nonetheless, this led to a great deal of um, opposition by some, most notably uh, General Akbar Khan. Uh, he led a conspiracy of something like 15, 14 uh, army officers and some three uh, civilians, uh, including Faiz Ahmad Faiz, the poet, in the Ralph Hindi conspiracy case. Uh, which in 1951, which was an attempted military coup, uh, the first of the military coup attempts uh, in uh, Pakistan's uh, history. It failed and Akbar Khan was uh, jailed. Uh, the army uh, blamed him for the um, uh, slow nationalization of the army officer positions. They blamed him for not capturing Kashmir uh, they blamed him for the plebiscite, the promise of a plebiscite that the United Nations, they thought that this was giving in uh, to India. But the problem was, of course, that the Pakistan army was not fit to fight a war with India. It did not have a, an a air force of any size. It did not have an army of any size. Uh, Liakat, uh, this was Liakat's uh, position, uh, and uh, uh, he was always very, very reasonable, I suppose, which is why he went to India uh, to, to sign a peace treaty with, uh, uh, with, uh, with India when it looked like there was going to be a war developing. So no, it was a, a difficult situation with the army. He was the defense minister. He did set up the... Uh, army training uh, grounds uh, and uh, he, 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 he 
negotiated with the British, he negotiated with the Americans, he negotiated with Australia to try to get weapons for the Indian army, but they all refused. So it was a difficult relationship uh, with the army. Right, well, we've probably just got time for one more question. There are lots of questions in the chat. And I'm sorry I spoke too long. No, 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 and there are lots of thanks to you for a wonderful lecture. Oh, thank um, you. There's just, there's a couple I've picked um, on his assassination in 1951. Yes. And people were just wondering what your views were on it and could sort of more sinister forces be ascribed to, you know, what was behind it? Anyway, I just... No, it's a good question, and it, it, it often comes up. This is a question, of course, that I asked Rana Liakat Ali Khan when I met her, and I have always asked his sons, especially uh, Akbar, um, what their mother said about this, and what Rana told me, this was the Punjab, uh, and uh, the um, general consensus is that Gula Muhammad was uh, in, uh, involved, Gomani was involved in this, uh, and uh, this has been widely publicized. This is a belief that Rana had. Uh, and uh, I suspect also that Akbar Khan was involved uh, in, in, this, in this as well. But it's one of those things I don't think we'll ever solve unless the Pakistani government has some documents that we're unaware of. The, the Pakistan government uh, uh, edits what documents to release. Even the cabinet papers uh, from uh, 1947 to 51, up until the 60s, they have released, but they, have, they edit them and they're very, very careful. Zaidi himself always edited what papers he would include in the Jinnah papers. The uh, Fatima Jinnah papers uh, have also, are also available in the National Archives in Islamabad, but they too have been edited from what I have been told. So whether there is anything in the, in the Pakistan government archives that we have not been told uh, about the assassination, I think it will remain a mystery. Well, I think we will finish there. Thank you so much for right. a really interesting and fascinating lecture. And um, we look forward to your <laughs> volumes being published soon. Okay. And I'd like to thank everyone very much for joining us tonight and um, I wish you all a very pleasant evening wherever you are. I think we are going to have thunderstorms very shortly after having a very, very hot day. So thank you very much indeed. And Thanks.